in my mind, no single piece of furniture evokes the romance of travel more than the steamship deck chair. And that's what we're going to build in this episode of Wood Academy TV. Now this one I've designed to be relatively simple. Think more SS United States or QE2 than Titanic. More of a mid-century modern feel and that's what I was going for. It also makes it a little bit easier for us to build. Now this episode is pretty much a straight up chair build. So the usual safety aspects apply. Eye protection and hearing protection should always be used in the shop. You know how I feel about that. But we're also going to be working with this Komaru, or as it's sometimes called, Brazilian teak. It's not actually teak, but it is a tropical hardwood grown in Brazil. And anytime you're working with an unfamiliar wood, especially when it's not a domestic species, a respirator is probably not a bad idea. Good dust collection at the table saw, because we are going to be doing a lot of ripping, and a respirator will remove pretty much any chance of you having a bad reaction, certainly at least in your lungs. And it's just a good idea to do when you're working with unfamiliar woods. Remember, you are your own best protection in the shop. Your best safety device is up here. In previous episodes of Wood Academy TV, you've seen me do mock-ups and prototypes. We did a full-scale prototype of the dining chair before we built the full set of six to make sure it was comfortable and sat well. You also saw me do a full-scale working mock-up of the folding leaf mechanism for our dining table. Again, to make sure that everything was going to work the way I assumed before I actually started cutting stock. But with this chair, I'm only building two and the idea of building a full-scale prototype without actually knowing whether the folding mechanism was going to work didn't make any sense. And a full-scale prototype really doesn't make sense when you're only making two anyways. And that's where a scale model is a really good idea. The chair is relatively simple. There aren't a lot of curved parts on it. In fact, there's only one. But the folding mechanism to make it fold up properly, that's the part that's not quite so easy to do without a highly sophisticated 3D CAD program. And this is where a scale model really comes in to help because I could try different configurations in different settings at a very minimal cost in both time and materials. I built probably three or four different models like this or of various versions and Overall, I probably used less than a single board foot of cherry to make this. It's quarter scale, so a quarter of an inch on the model equals one full inch in, in life. And it really allowed me to figure out some things. One of the things that I had seen in a lot of the chairs that I had studied, folding chairs, was that there was often a sliding connecting mechanism in order to make the chair uh, fold properly. And that was because the pivot points weren't at regular intervals. And so when you folded it, they changed their dimension. And so you had to have some kind of a sliding connector to make that work. And I looked at that, but one of the problems I ran into is where do I get that sliding mechanism? For the original chairs that were made for steamships, parts like that were manufactured for the chair. They're not available anymore. And there's no way I want to go through trying to uh, recreate them in the shop. A lid stay for a jewelry box or something like that is very close, but just not strong enough. But using the models let me figure out something. If the distance between the pivot points remains the same throughout the pivot, then the folding works without any sliding mechanism. It's like having a poorly nailed together box that just kind of flops over on its side without actually coming apart. And so once I was able to figure that out, then the rest of the build design or the design part became easy. 
And that was all figured out because of the scale models. So don't pass up this opportunity if you're working on a piece that you're not sure how the joints are going to work or how pieces are going to move, or even for looking at style and proportion. A scale model is often a really good idea. Traditionally, a deck chair like this would have been made from teak. But in today's world, that's really not an option. Teak is expensive, it's hard to find, and it's not terribly environmentally friendly. So I needed to find a new material or a different material that would have the similar weather and insect resistance and similar strength to be able to build my chair, but be environmentally friendly. So I took a trip up to Sarasota to visit with my friends at Advantage Trim and Lumber and see what they had to suggest. I'm here with Rob Pelk. He's the owner of Advantage Trim and Lumber, one of our sponsors here at Wood Academy. And this is their Sarasota facility. But this isn't the only one you have though, is it Rob? No, we have our, our flagship store in, in Buffalo, New York. We have a location near Los Angeles, California and Santa Fe Springs. Uh, we have a facility near Charlotte, North Carolina and Grover, North Carolina. And then of course, Sarasota, Florida where our, our sawmill is. And we also have operations in the north of Brazil and near the city of Belang. That's cool. One of the reasons I wanted to bring you here to the Sarasota facility is because of their urban foresting program. So Advantage Trim and Lumber takes logs that otherwise would be burned or thrown in a landfill and using a sawmill will saw them into usable slabs and lumber so that they can be reclaimed and used. And how many different species do you guys get through here? Uh, we, we handle probably 100 different species. There's about 600 different species growing in Florida. About 200 of those belong here. So there's a lot of invasive species uh, from Australia, from Asia, from South America that are growing here. Not all those species are friendly. Some of them crowd out native species, uh, actually cause harm to the environment, harm to sea turtle life, uh, and, and other animals that are, are living in Florida. So it's important. Uh, yeah, so we find it important to utilize these logs into, into wood slabs. We, we cut them here, we kiln dry them, and then we, we put them on our website just for slabs, woodslabs.com. It's kind of separate from advantagelumber.com. And that's just if you're looking to build a table, a conference room, a shelf, or any kind of woodworking you want a wood slab, you'll see different species on there. Most of those slabs are from our urban logging program. So this is a northern hickory. Uh, you know, typical hickory that everybody knows, seen flooring, seen yeah, cabinets. Yeah, you can see the flooring. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I'd, some people like hickory, but it's, it's a little blasé for me after working with a lot of exotics and seeing all the wood that we see through here. So uh, this is why I say this is some special hickory, is you get some really cool colors. And as you get deeper into this log, it, it'll get even more crazy. But you get some cool colors coming up out of the, out of the mineral and the dirt that this was growing in. So regular hickory, advantage hickory. That's pretty cool. <laughs> So Rob, one of the reasons I'm here, this is the chair we're building in this episode of Wood Academy. It's a simplified version of a steamship deck chair, and it is designed to fold up just like the original. Awesome. Yeah, the only problem is that traditionally this would have been a teak piece. And, you know, as you know, teak is just not really responsible anymore. It's hard to get, it's brutal on tools, it's gonna to be very expensive. But we want a good quality hardwood that's gonna resist insects and rot because it's gonna be outside. What do you recommend? So a lot of people call here asking for teak and then they find out what the price of Burmese teak is and they look at the ecological aspects of Burmese teak right now and it's not that friendly. So a lot of that stuff has been cut and it's, uh, it's not really good forestry practices that are done with the Burmese teak. We have what we call Brazilian teak. Uh, it, it's just a, a branded name, Brazilian teak. It's not actually in the, in, in the teak family. Uh, we sell here as Kumaru. It's a Brazilian hardwood that is responsibly harvested. And the Jenka hardness of this is about three times that of oak. So you're gonna build that, that chair out of that and these will be essentially hurricane proof because the only drawback is it's heavy. But in Florida, that's a good thing when the wind starts blowing around. These aren't, you're not gonna be chasing these down, down to your dock. Now it sounds like it's the right thing to use, and uh, the next thing to do is to uh, grab my cut list and start picking some stuff up. Yeah, so the, the nice thing here too is you don't have to grab a bunch of rough boards and then start planing all day. You can call us up and say, hey, I want a piece of five quarter by six, eight foot long, a piece 10 foot long, a piece 20 foot long. 
Uh, you can also say I want a two by six or a four by four. We have it already dimensioned for decking, for building chairs, outdoor pergolas, uh, those kinds of items. So that saves you a lot of work and it, it saves you a lot of waste. We have a couple million board feet in this room and there's not a single knot. Uh, these come from very nice logs, so you see you won't find a single knot in here. So you, you have very little waste when you start cutting this up for a furniture project. So Rob, I want to thank you for your time today and showing me your operation here. It's really impressive and I, we've had a great time visiting with oh, you. Oh, it's always great to have you here. And uh, we'd like your viewers to check out AdvantageLumber.com when they're looking for the Brazilian hardwoods like this. And if they're looking for a slab project, you can go to our, our slab site, which is WoodSlabs.com. You'll find a bunch of beautiful kiln dried slabs and we were always running some free shipping specials. You can click the button and cool stuff shows up at your door. Thanks Rob. Thank you. A big thank you to the whole team at Advantage. We had a great day at their facility in Sarasota and the Komaru turned out to be an excellent choice for the chair. It looks great, it works easily and it'll last a good long time even down here in sunny Florida. So let's get started with the build. You know that I'm always going to tackle the hardest part of the project first because that way any changes I need to make down the line are easier to do. In the case of our chair here, this is going to be this part. This is the side rails or the rear leg if you want to call it that. The seat goes here and then this transitions into the rear feet. The problem is that if we were to try and cut this piece out of a single blank of wood, there's going to be a lot of waste and it's going to have to be at least six, six inches wide to accommodate this curve. We don't want the grain running the long way here because through the leg, it'll be weak right about here, which is one of the highest stress points of the project. So I want to make this part with the grain running across this way, but then I want the straight part with the grain running that way. And the simple solution to that is to make this in two parts and do a half lap to bond them together. And that's exactly what we've done. Four of these feet are needed and a template will make sure that they're all the same. The downloadable plans for this project include a measured drawing that walks you through making this template step by step. Start by marking the bottom ends of the foot on the lower edge of the template stock. The bottom of the foot is created using a 30 degree line drawn up from the first of these marks. The opposite end of the foot is created by drawing a 70 degree line up from the second mark. The half lap section is then created perpendicular to this 70 degree line. A line extended 11 and a half inches from the inside edge of the half lap is the center point for the arcs. Which are drawn in using a trammel to connect the ends of the foot together. After you cut it out and sand it smooth, use the template to lay out the foot locations on the 1x5 stock. Rough cut the feet to size, being careful to leave about a 30 second outside all of the lines. I like to use fast cap spline nails to connect my templates to the parts that are being flush trimmed. These are basically double ended nails that go between two pieces of wood to connect them together surprisingly securely. And they only leave a minimal hole. Now all the feet get flush trimmed to the template. Notice that I'm beginning with the template on top of the part and I'm using a start pin to engage the cutter. I'll flush trim half the foot this way, only cutting the parts where the grain is going away from the template. To cut the other half of the foot, I flipped it over so the template's on the bottom and I've raised the bit so that the bottom bearing on this bit engages the template. 
Flipping the part over reverses the grain direction relative to the cutter. The second half of the cut will all be with the grain falling away so I get a cleaner cut. Don't worry if you don't have a double bearing bit like this one. Just use a standard flush trim bit for the part where the template's on top and a pattern bit when you're cutting with the template below. The rear feet will be attached to the legs using a 4 inch long half lap joint. On the straight sections this is simple. The rip fence is set to 4 inches from the left side of the dado blade and the half laps cut until the end of the piece touches the rip fence. Because we're not cutting all the way through the part it's perfectly safe to use the miter gauge and the rip fence in this operation. The half laps on the curved feet require a little bit more care. The saw setup is exactly the same, but the only straight reference section on the foot itself is where the half lap will be cut. As you form the half lap, you'll need to make sure that that straight section remains tight against the miter gauge. And at the end, you'll need to be holding the part to the miter gauge close to the rip fence. If that makes you nervous, a small clamp can certainly be employed here. The half laps can now be clamped together using epoxy. Wax paper keeps the epoxy under control until it's finished curing. If the joints are properly cut, just a couple of clamps are needed at this point. Anytime you need to glue up tropical hardwoods or any woods that have a high oil content, it's always wise to clean all of the mating surfaces with acetone, removing the oils from the areas where the glue will be applied. On our chair here, I did this for the half laps as well as all the mortise and tenon joints. When the epoxy is fully cured, the legs can be sanded smooth ensuring that there's no step along the joints. My original design only included the epoxy to hold these half laps together, but this is a high stress point and the glue joints kept failing. In the end, I glued the joint with epoxy, then reinforced it with a pair of quarter 20 brass screws with acorn nuts. This solution solved the problem without detracting from the overall look of the chair. With just a few exceptions, the rest of the parts for the chair are pretty much ripped to width, cut to length. The sides for the leg rests and the seat do need to have a 14 degree angle cut into the end of each. With the sides of the rest, it's easiest to cut the angle first then trim the overall part to length. The rear leg should already be the correct size, so set a stop to trim the angle back to the longest point. Next, tenons need to be formed on the ends of each of the rails. Make each shoulder cut half inch wide and half inch deep. The cheek cuts are the same half inch wide but only 3 eighths of an inch deep. The tenon should finish at 1 inch wide and 3 quarters thick, but cut them just a little bit oversized so we can fit them to the mortises later. Once the ends of all the rails have been tenoned, they need to be grooved to accept the slats that make up the seat. The half inch wide, half inch deep grooves are not centered so it's a good idea to mark the seat side of all the parts before starting. The dado set is restacked to 5 eighths of an inch and an auxiliary face is attached to the rip fence. The dado is buried into the fence until a half an inch is showing and this setup is used to cut the tenons in all of the slats. Both ends of each slat need to be cut with a single shoulder forming an offset tenon. Before drilling for the hardware and the mortises, rounding over the edges of all the seat parts is a good idea. An eighth inch bit is set up in the router table and the edges of all the parts are eased on this. 
and don't forget the rear legs before breaking down the setup. Mortises need to be 3 quarter by 1 inch, so we'll use a 3 quarter inch Forstner bit at the drill press. But here's a trick to get consistent 1 inch lengths when drilling your mortises. Set the stop for the furthest part of the mortise, then use a quarter inch setup block between the part and the stop to widen the mortise by the same amount on every piece. With the majority of the waste removed, the mortises can be squared up using a chisel. The size of the mortise is defined by the drilling, the corners just need to be squared off. Now is an excellent time to do a dry fit of all of our sub-assemblies. Here we've got the seat. And a dry fit is really important here because the parts that make up the seat need to fit between the rails. If this part is not cut to the correct length, then the mortise and tenon joints between the rails and the legs will have to move. And so doing a dry fit at this point proves to us that everything is correct and fits properly so that we don't run into trouble when we start gluing this all together. So we've got our three sub-assemblies. We've got the seat part here. We've got the seat back, which actually fits in between, like so. As you can see, there's our chair seat. And then we have the leg rest part here that will actually hinge to the front of the seat. Those are our three main sub-assemblies. The next thing we need to do is to drill the holes that we'll use to pin all of the pivot points together so that the chair folds. So as an example, where the back meets the seat, we're going to have a through hole through the, seat, the leg here that's a half an inch that will take the bushing for our screw. But then on the seat back, we're going to have a 3 8 slightly larger than 3 8 hole in which we'll put the threaded insert that takes the quarter 20 bolt. We could fix it if we get this wrong, but it'll be a lot better if we get it right to begin with. So on the drawings that come with the plans, all of these holes are carefully marked as to whether they're going to be the 3 8 size or the half inch size. Take your time, print out the drawings for the individual pieces if you have to, and then you can follow along and make all the drilling at the proper position. And again, this is very precise drilling. We want everything to be lined up. So we're going to use the drill press table that we built in the last episode of Wood Academy. Just about all the holes will use the same fence position on the drill press. So set that first. It needs to be accurately along the center line of the parts. I chose to measure and mark all of the drill locations on all of the parts, even when I was going to be using stops. It's just a good way to double check your work. And pay attention to which holes are which. Holes for the pivot bushings will be half inch, but the holes for the threaded inserts may be 3 8 to 7 16 of an inch, depending on the inserts you're using. There are different sorts of tools available for installing brass inserts by hand or using a screw gun. But I like using the drill press. It allows for putting the inserts straight into the wood, and that's important for this project. A couple of nuts are jammed together on a short piece of threaded rod. In this case, a bolt with the head cut off. Add a washer, and then the insert is threaded into place on the rod. Then the quill is lowered, and the chuck used by hand to screw the insert into the wood. Clamping the part in place keeps it from lifting, so the insert is actually drawn into the wood. Because there are four armrests that all need to be the same, a template will be used to shape them. The template is laid out on half inch plywood using the measurements in the plans. The curves are laid out by hand. It's more important that they're smooth and pleasing to the eye than particularly accurate to any dimension. The arm template is cut out on the bandsaw as close to the lines as possible. Then the edges are sanded smooth and even. 
Remember that any flaw in the template will be replicated on your parts. Just as with the legs, the arms are roughed out on the bandsaw, and then flush trim to final shape using the template. The pivot blocks under the arms will also need a template, but it's small enough that the drawing can be printed out in full scale and pasted onto the plywood. Then the shapes are traced onto the stock and rough cut out as before. But these parts are a little small for flush trimming, so they'll be sanded to the final shape. These parts will be mostly hidden, they don't have to perfectly match, and it's the position of the pivot location that's really important. An additional detail on this part is that the ends also need to be rounded over. But along a different plane than the profile. The measured drawings in the plan show this. So here at the end of part one of our deck chair build, all the parts and pieces have been made up and they're ready to be assembled. In part two, we'll put the major sub-assemblies together and then combine them into a couple of deck chairs. So join us for the next episode of Woodcademy TV.